Hi, this is Dennis with Second Chance Tackle, and I'm going to do another one of these company history uh, reports just to help everybody learn a little bit more about who fishing reel manufacturers were, what inspired them, and uh, what kept their company going, and how their company has evolved over time. And today I've picked a very special one. I've picked Zebco, uh, and we're going to talk about the Zebco company and its history. And before we even get started, I'm not the expert here. I'm simply the reporter. Uh, I don't claim to know everything about these companies, but uh, to the extent that I can pass some interest along to you and you can do further research uh, and understanding about their product lines and particulars, then I welcome you to do that. But I want to give some credits out there. The first uh, credit I want to give to is the American Oil and Gas Historical Society. They publish an almanac, which tells a little bit of the history, the early history of the company. I want to uh, shout out to Dick Braun for two articles that he had in Orca Real News. Uh, the most recent one was just in January of 2020. He also published an article on Zebco in the 2010 issue, uh, where uh, he's the expert. They seem to call him Mr. Zebco or Zebco Man. And then also uh, I want to shout out to a publication that Betty over at Orca was nice enough to send me. It's the history of the fishing reel, the best of the real news, where I found some of these articles. And uh, in there as well, there's one from Paul Winstead uh, from a 2000 issue about Zebco as well. Uh, also, some notes to the W.C. Bradley website, which is the current owner of Zebco. So we're going to talk a little bit about Zebco and about uh, their founding and what the ideas were behind the reel and uh, so on. So let's start with the founding then. So the founder is a fellow named Jasper R. Dell Hull. Uh, he went by R. D. Hull and he was a watchmaker and an avid fisherman in West Texas. He had a problem. The typical uh, reels of the time, the bait casters, reels like this, this is a fluger, but a reel like this was subject to backlash on casting and it bothered him. He, uh, he got tired of clearing out the backlashes and he wanted to understand how can I uh, solve the backlash problem. Well, he attributed the backlash problem to the free spool or the rotating spool and tried to figure out how do I get rid of the rotating spool in order to uh, eliminate that backlash problem. So he came up with a simple design. And he designed a, uh, what would he call a fixed spool. And this is actually, this is mine, it's not his, but uh, this is how he solved the problem. He said, if I had a fixed spool that would roll line, I could eliminate backlash. I'll just show you kind of how that works. And so he, he just put some pegs or nails onto a, a piece of plywood. I'm not having any success. He had more success than I did with this. And if I could just wind it around that, then when I dropped it, I had the fixed spool. I'm doing a lousy job with this. But I had a fixed spool. And uh, when I went to release it, since the spool wouldn't be turning, that's enough of that, uh, the spool wouldn't be turning, uh, then I could eliminate backlash. Well, he had one problem and I just experienced it. It was the line was coming off the top. So what did he do? I'm going to be historically somewhat accurate with this. He got a Folgers coffee can lid. And he decided to put a screw in it and have that act as a cap to the line. Well, then how do you line, how do you roll a line? So we put four notches into the cap so that at any stage you could, could capture that and that notch would act as a line roller. And then he simply put the cap over the, the nails, put the screw in. I'm not going to put the screw in because, well, maybe I'll start it. Put the screw in. That would enable the cap to rotate. And then from the underside, he could put a gear that would rotate the cap, pick up the line, and it would roll. I'm not doing a good job of this, but you kind of see the idea of how this works. So that was his idea, and that idea happened in 1947. So in 1947, he figured, I've got an idea here on how to solve backlash. I need a manufacturer. And he approached a company in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The company was called the Zero Hour Bomb Company. And uh, I know what you're thinking, because I thought the same thing. They were making bombs for World War II. Well, maybe. 
I haven't got that far in the history, but that's why I credited the American Oil and Gas Historical Society's almanac earlier, because what happened in uh, is that the zero hour uh, bomb company from Tulsa was a manufacturer of electric timeters that set off blasting caps and torpedo bombs in oil wellheads. And that was uh, kind of early fracking as we know it today. The idea was to cause uh, uh, breakage in the wells and have more oil flow in. Well, that worked well in the, in the 1930s. That's when they were doing this. And uh, right through post-World War II, they were very involved in producing oil for the war effort. However, after the war ended, demand slowed and their business fell on hard times. There was an oil glut because everybody was producing oil for the war and once the war ended, you lost that consumption. And the second thing was that after the war, Middle Mid East uh, oil production ramped up and it was a plentiful source of cheap crude versus the higher priced Oklahoma crude. So it seems like everybody came at the right time. J.D. Hull, or J. J. R. D. Hull, depending on how you would like it, uh, he approaches the Zero Hour Bomb Company as a manufacturer, comes up with this crazy idea with the pegs on the board and the coffee can lid and uh, basically sells them to become a manufacturer of the Zebco reel. So that was in 1947. 48 was spent uh, perfecting the design and the production. And it started in 1949 with the reel called the, the Zebco standard. Now I don't have one of those, but we all have Zebcos and it really didn't change very much in all of the years. Uh, actually, I took one apart here. This is a Zebco 202 the most popular reel ever manufactured and boy if it doesn't look like the same though we don't have we don't have metal uh, rungs inside here I'll take the cap off or if I can we have a, a fixed spool instead of the pegs but we have that coffee can lid don't we we have a serrated edge that holds the line on and distributes the line as you crank and then what he put on the bottom was a simple gear mechanism that enabled you to turn the spool and he put in a release mechanism so that the lid could lift up and the line could come off without being trapped. So that design is still around today and uh, Zebco is still manufacturing those reels today. So in 49 he started it was a product called the Standard and uh, they kept producing these under the Zero Hour Bomb Company until 1956 when they officially changed their name to Zebco. Interestingly enough, there's a little side story here that said the reason it got changed was that they sent a, uh, uh, a reel to President Eisenhower at the White House uh, that was basically confiscated and uh, I don't know what happened, but uh, they were afraid that something was amiss when they saw the return address as the zero hour bomb climb. I can't understand why they would seize that. But at any rate, Zebco became short for that. And uh, that was the official name was changed in 56. And then uh, the production ramped up, it doubled, it quadrupled, it really caught on fire, it became a, a raging success. And uh, Zebco started to broaden its base. In 1959, Zebco introduced the 77B reel and rod for young anglers. It was the first time that anybody had ever uh, targeted children as a marketplace. And uh, the rod, reel and rod was the first combination. It was the first prepackaged combination available in the market. So they, uh, they introduced that and then the following year was the balanced um, tackle concept. That carries on today. Uh, this is an old uh, a Zebco rod and reel, probably from the last five years, six years. But the balanced tackle is they were going to match reels to rods so that the angler didn't have to worry about purchasing a rod and then having a mismatched set. So that happened all the way back in 1960. I think we all as kids probably had one of these. In 1960 they also introduced the 101 reel and then followed in 62 by the 202. That's the one I had apart. And here's one that's much later, but it's also a 202. This is the most popular, most manufactured, highest volume reel ever made, the 202. Started in 1962 and it's still available today. And uh, the, the design, as we said, really hasn't changed from that coffee can lid and those stacked uh, uh, pieces 
uh, that were put onto the plywood when he first talked about it. So that was 62, but a lot of things happened in 62, and one of them was that Zebco was acquired. And Zebco uh, was acquired by uh, Brunswick. Brunswick Corporation uh, was in the recreational business. Many of us have uh, grown up using their products. Brunswick made pool tables and they made bowling equipment, among other things. But what Brunswick did was they gave Zebco the national distribution and they gave them the resources to go out and expand the tackle business. So one of the things that uh, they did early after that was they acquired the Langley Corporation of California. And we talked about that on another one of my real history videos. That was the dental works that got involved in the war, became uh, uh, specialists in aluminum, started making spinning reels and lever wine reels in the 50s. And uh, when they acquired, when Zebco acquired Langley in 63, it gave them the manufacturing and the engi engineering capabilities to produce spinning and uh, level wine reels. Well, they continued their innovation, and in 1967, they launched the salt water uh, version of this. Many of us have seen it. It's the 808. It's a big reel. And uh, using the uh, Langley engineers uh, to design spinning reels, they, uh, they did the biggest launch ever in 1973. And in 1973, they introduced 17 new spinning reels, largely eliminating the Langley brand and taking over spinning reels to uh, be sold under the, uh, the Zebco brand. So they did that. That was cool. Uh, they continued their innovation with the spin cast reels. Now, this is not a Zebco. This is a Daiwa, but Zebco was the first to introduce an under-the-pole spin cast uh, reel, and that was their Omega series, and that got introduced in 1979. So if you have an Omega, you know how to date it, 1979 and uh, above. In 1980, they came out with the 6000 series. I have two of those here. There were five different reels. Uh, in the, in the uh, 6000 series, it went from an ultralight to the salt water varieties. And in 1981, they came out with the 7000 series. So if you have a Zebco 6000 or a 7000 series, uh, they date to the 1980s. And this is where they started getting into the salt water side of the business as well. And uh, between all of these, the, the 202s, here's the 33, the, uh, here's the 33 made in China. Here's a 33 uh, with the Rhino branding on it. Uh, but they, uh, all of those things continued from uh, the 80s and into the 90s until production was moved to China in 2000. So this is an authentic 33 uh, Zebco, and uh, it still works fine. And uh, if you'll notice, if you turn it underneath, it says Made in China. So if you have a Made in China Zebco, it, uh, it was made after 2000. And if you have one that reads Made in the USA, as this one does with the Rhino Tough, uh, well, then that one was made prior to 2000. And depending on the, the type of uh, uh, one that you have, um, you can date accordingly. So Zebco did a lot of interesting things in their, uh, in their uh, histories. They were the first with a spin cast reel. They invented that, right, by uh, R.D. Hall. Uh, they were the first to introduce, introduce the, uh, the balance tackle. Again, this is on a spinning reel, but every one of us had that darn little uh, spin caster that we had as, uh, as kids who were growing up. Uh, they were the first to target young anglers. They were the first to na advertise nationally in non-sports magazines like Life. And they were the first to sponsor a national radio show in the 50s uh, with the Zebco Sportsman. So they've always been on that cutting edge of, uh, of innovation and their products uh, have stood the test of time. In 2000, they moved their production to China, as I mentioned. And in 2001, the business was sold to WC Bradley Corporation. Uh, and that's who owns uh, Zebco today. In 2011, they reacquired Zebco Europe to reuni reunite, uh, reunify the brand. And uh, in 2014, they acquired Preston Innovations. That's a UK company with the brands Corum, Ad Avid Carp, and Sonia Bates uh, added to their line. So today, as you look at Zebco, if you go to the WC Bradley site, you'll find that Zebco also markets Quantum, Finor, Rhino, 
and Van Stahl in addition to these other brands. So it's been an interesting ride for this company. They're still in business today. They've morphed several times over, but their core product line, the closed or spin cast reel, and their lower price uh, uh, entry level uh, rod and reel balance tackle for uh, young anglers is still very much uh, their point of uh, business and their market. Uh, Zebco has received a lot of awards, according to their uh, magazine, for targeting young children and educating them on fishing. Uh, and uh, they've been uh, producing uh, educational videos and other things as well. So that's, uh, that's where I'm going to stop uh, with the history of uh, the Zebco company. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope I've teased your, your imagination and thinking and desire maybe to learn a little bit more about them. I would encourage you to uh, go out and find more stories. Uh, interesting asides. I mean, one of the things I found when uh, uh, researching this was the inspiration for uh, Mr. Hall was the hornet's nest, the old uh, string uh, dispensers that they had in dry goods stores and uh, grocery stores where they used to use the bind packaging. He, could, he looked at it and said, how can the line come out and, uh, and have it packaged uh, and not, uh, not free spool or get all tangled up. So uh, a lot of things that you can learn from this and I would encourage you to learn more. And if you know more, please share that uh, on the, uh, in the comments because I'm always open to learning more as well. That's the whole idea behind these Fishing Reels series. So if you've enjoyed that, please subscribe. I'm going to be doing more of these and uh, subscribe to see the real repairs and, and learn a little bit more about the manufacturers and dating the products as well. So this is Dennis with Second Chance Tackle. Thank you for watching.